So today I'm uh, getting ready for hunting season. It doesn't look like it, but uh, it's, it's fast approaching. Um, so I'm making jerky today, but it's also the first step in, in pemmican. I, I tell a wee bit of history about um, the pemmican industry, and it was, in today's dollars, would be a multi-million dollar industry in the 17 and early 1800s. But I'm making jerky for, um, we're going to be doing some trekking, we're going to start scouting. We harvested three deer last fall, uh, had no luck with moose, uh, hope to change that. We're heading to northern Quebec, um, uh, second week of October, and I'll be trying that new musket I built, so we'll see how that goes. But today I'm making jerky and I'm making it out of, uh, we still have remnants of venison left over, so I'm going to be smoking it. And the process of making jerky, it's not like if we think of modern jerky that you can kind of chew on and it's sort of rubbery. Jerky, in order for it to be preserved as a, as a, f a food supply, has to, be, um, has to be hard. It has to be totally dehydrated. And if I think about making pemmican as another step, which we're going to show on another day, um, you actually pulverize it. You pulverize it into a powder that is mixed with the, with the fats and the berries. So uh, yeah, as soon as I get this uh, smudge fire going here a little bit, I'm going to cut up the meat. So wild game is the perfect meat for making uh, jerky out of. Um, it's not marbled like, like uh, domesticated meat, um, so there's virtually no fat in it. When you get chunks that, uh, I'll separate this piece here, it's like... Um, just like our anatomy, it's it's the separation of different muscle groups, and this this material you hear this isn't fat. It's called silver skin, and if you take that silver skin and you dry it out, you pulverize it. It'll break into these long, thin fibers, and essentially that sinew. It's what uh, indigenous peoples and a lot of pioneers would have used for sewing uh, moccasins, shooting bags, and knife sheaths, etc. So. We're going to cut this really, really thin, and we don't want to cook it. What we're doing is smoking it, and apparently what happens is the wood, the smoke um, gases burning off the wood have a gas in it that actually works as a preservant to the meat. So this is about a 24-hour process if I want it bone dry. So I'm going to be sleeping back here at night and, and monitoring it, and uh, we should have uh, jerky in the morning. So you think about the importance of pemmican in, in the uh, fur trade industry, because we have this image of the Cour de Bois heading off in these huge canoe uh, brigades, hunting off the land as they went. They didn't. They had a short window of time when the ice was off the rivers and lakes to travel countless miles. So the Canot de Nord, the standard um, canoe, 24 foot, used by them, had a company of six men. And bales that they carried, whether it was trade goods in or furs out, weighed 90 pounds each. And they had 25 bales in that canoe with six men. Uh, four of those bales were food. So, and they didn't have time to hunt off the land, as I mentioned. So a lot of that food in those, in those um, bales was pemmican. Uh, it's believed that pemmican originated in the northern tribes, sort of uh, 
current Minnesota, North Dakota area uh, by the Lakota. And their word for it was uh, washna. And wa meaning anything, and, and the latter part meaning fat or grease. Uh, it was also commonly made and consumed by woodland Indians. So Cree, um, Huron, uh, Algonquin linguistic groups. And their name for it was Pai Mai Can. And that's where the French come up with the pemmican out of that. Basically the way the, the, the Ojibwe would say it. Uh, and Pai Mai Can basically means manufactured grease. So it has a lifespan of years. And, and the interesting history of this is, and where it became a huge advantage to the Northwest Company, who were complete rivals to the Hudson Bay Company. So the Hudson Bay Company are trapping in King Rupert's land. So all the areas and the waters draining into Hudson Bay and James Bay. Northwest Company, they're moved west. They're into the North Saskatchewan, the um, Athabasca, the Red River area. And we now have a huge population of Métis people. Well, the Métis turned this into an industry. So they'd take their Red River carts, they'd truck out into the plains, they'd kill the, the buffalo, process it into pemmican, sew it into rawhide bags, cart it back and sell it to all the forts and outposts. Uh, and they bought it by the ton and tons and tons. Uh, in fact, at one point, I'm trying to think, uh, in the 1800s, there was a governor, um, Miles McConnell, and, and he, pa he passed the Pemmican Proclamation. <laughs> God, that's how important this food source was to the people of the area. And he basically he said, well, you can't export it. It's too important to our economy. And, uh, well, Métis weren't going to have any part of that. So it was a very short-lived proclamation because it almost caused a war. So, as I mentioned, today I'm making pemmican. Ah, there's jobs that are hard, like building forts, and then this is my job for today. It's not so bad. I, I might even get out my fiddle and try to scratch on it. Uh, but, yeah, I'm just going to sit here, keep a slow fire going, occasionally turn it, uh, probably sleep out here, as I mentioned, for the night. And tomorrow morning I'll have jerky that I can either take on the trail or I could turn into pemmican.